tell y'all about it, but, but I'm sure one of you scoundrels would probably go and buy it out from under me just to get a big laugh. So uh, we will we will let you know uh, how it goes. But we're looking looking forward to going and uh, getting that. Are you sure uh, it's we? Say again. Are you sure it's we? Rhonda says she's going. <laughs> <laughs> she's going. She, she needs to see the next healthy Rhonda. See if it'll float. So, uh, if you got a handout, that's great. We have some more up, up front, I think, here. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started with, with, our, with our lesson today. And a question up here. Uh, what is the difference between a priest and a prophet? Y'all know right on? Yeah. What? A priest was only from the tribe of Levi, and a prophet could be from other tribes. What was their, their duties? Priests were assigned by lot as to what they did in Jerusalem. Um, and so they didn't always do the same thing, but, uh, it, but unless they were the high priest. And then uh, the prophets, didn't. some of them weren't even from Jerusalem. Right. I thought prophets were the excess of your remnant of your... That too. <laughs> It comes from CPA, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, the next question then is what or when have you perceived God asked you to do something you were unprepared for? Now, this kind of touches probably a little on our lesson today about dealing with the Holy Spirit. Uh, when have you perceived God asking you to do something that you were unprepared for? Or have you? Yes, ma'am. All of it. All of it. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, doors opened. It, they're just there. And you have to make a decision. Doors open and you do. That, uh -huh. that, that is true. And you feel like God's opening those doors, right? Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? I think sometimes we think So you're more qualified, more prepared than what you think you are. Yeah, yeah. You may you think you're not. Maybe you prepared right. yourself to somebody else. Right. But uh, I think God actually prepares you in a lot of ways. Okay. Well, good. I had a situation that we had a correspondence ministry, and uh, Bill McDonough went to Romania, and he put an advertisement in for our courses. We got three thousand six hundred requests, mm -hmm. and uh, so we did it at home. And then the elders called me in and said. How's the work going? I told him, he said, well, don't you think you need to go over there and look at it? And I never intended to be a missionary. <laughs> That's and true. You were a missionary to Romania for... In and out. 12 years. 12, 12 years. 12 years over a 15-year period. Three weeks period. and two hours. <laughs> <laughs> That's my parents-in-law right there. <laughs> well, good. Sometimes we have... Um, immediate things or, or significant changes in one day to the next. A parent, a spouse, a widow, a widower. So there are changes from one day to the next that some, I think all of those when you, when, you're, when you change from one day to another are harder. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll press on then from that because that kind of leads us into our lesson. Uh, Ezekiel was a priest who was called to be a prophet. Now, let me go ahead and preface this. We're going to be looking at, at Ezekiel here and wondering what minor prophet. So let me go ahead and get you prepared. What was that kid's name? Who's the, He's the... Uh, not a witch, but a warlock, or he could do magic. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. You would think I would know that. So, Ezekiel, this book is Harry Potter on steroids. Okay? Yeah, I'm serious. 
you've ever read this book, it's pretty wild. Okay? So hold on to your seats. Because this one gets interesting. And we're going to see that. But I just want to give you the heads up. Since I said he was a minor prophet. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a minor prophet. He's just a prophet. Oh, okay. I know I'm a, I knew I was going to be on this list. This is my first time to be for a few days. Help me. Help me. We're talking about Ezekiel today. Anyway, he was a priest who was called to be a prophet. Ezekiel 1, verses 2 and 3. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim. Now, sometimes, as I mentioned, on these prophets, they're easier. Some of them are easier to date than others because they give us a little information that we can see not only from the Bible, but from secular uh, historical references, okay? So, the word, of the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Uzziah, by the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was on him. As a priest in the temple, Ezekiel was probably born and raised in Jerusalem. He was carried into Babylonian exile in the second wave of captives when Jehoiakim and 10,000 leading citizens of Jerusalem were carried away in 597 B.C. Well, you get that in 2 Kings 24, 10 through 14. Ezekiel received a call to be a prophet in the fifth year of Jehoiakim's exile. He received his call at the age of 30. It says in my 30th year, Ezekiel 1 1. Normally, a Levitical priest assumed the full duties of the priesthood at this age, but instead, the Lord called Ezekiel to be a prophet. Ezekiel was married, but his wife died shortly after the Babylonians uh, raised uh, Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in 586 BC. Ezekiel will preach some in Babylon, some in Jerusalem. It appears that some of the exiles were allowed to travel back and forth between Jerusalem and Babylon. Whoa, uh, Jeremiah 29. You got to slow down. I'm sorry. We're not keeping up. Yeah. And this is really important. I want every note. <laughs> <laughs> every word. <laughs> we have an appointment to see a photo. <laughs> Moving right along. We might do Ezekiel part two next week. <laughs> okay. I'm caught up. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, they were able to travel back and forth between Jerusalem and Babylon. Ezekiel was apparently part of that privileged group. It's apparent. That some of Ezekiel's messages were delivered in person to those in Babylon, while others to those in Jerusalem. It was typical of Old Testament prophets to have visions and perform symbolic acts, and then to explain their meaning. Jeremiah 13, 1 through 11, uh, talking about Jeremiah, was told to buy a linen belt. Wear it for a while without washing it, and then bury it in the crevice of a rock. After recovering the degraded belt, it was intended to symbolize what was going to happen to the nation of Judah. God used a lot of symbolism with the prophets back then. He also had, Jeremiah had visions of an almond rod and a boiling pot, Jeremiah 1, 11 through 15. So, the preponderance of Ezekiel's ministry is going to involve these two categories, visions and symbolic acts. Visions, symbolic acts. Have you ever dreamed, and in your dream, like something you'll have, might be people in your dream from like 40 years ago, but they're in your dream on something that's present day. Some I mean, people in here aren't 40 years old, sweetie. <laughs> 10 years old. Okay. I got a boat appointment. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, please know I'm kidding. I do have a boat appointment. It's later this afternoon. But uh, you know, for those of you, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, whatever it might be, uh, something that's mixed in from then, it's mixed in now, and it's like these two events have never happened together, but now they're in my dream and they are. That was kind of the, it's, it's kind of interesting as I, I read Ezekiel to, to think about those things as, as, his, his dreams and his visions and all that, that we're going to see here. 
uh, coming together. It's almost like a conglomeration of a whole bunch of different things that have happened. So, like I said, visions and symbolic acts. The, yet the things which Ezekiel did and saw were much more outlandish than that experienced by the other prophets. Like I said, Harry Potter on steroids. He was Ezekiel 8, or Ezekiel 3, 25-27, and then also 24. He was struck mute, not allowed to speak, and he was transported from one place to another by what appeared to be a big old hand. Ezekiel 8, 2 and 3, listen to that. Struck mute, couldn't speak, transported from one place to another by what appeared to be a big old hand. That's, that's, that's in the Bible. <clears throat> Y'all remember all this? I remember it's weird. That's just two examples of many that demonstrate the unusual nature of Ezekiel's ministry. Uh, begins with a very dramatic call. Uh, God's appearance to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1, 1 through 28, fifth year of Ezekiel's exile, he saw visions of God. The 30th year, fourth month and fifth day, which I was, while I was among the exiles to keep our river, the heavens were open. And I saw visions of God. The visions which follow are going to be dramatic, almost indecipherable. Ezekiel will use terms and figures to describe what is in truth indescribable. <laughs> so some of these visions we're going to look at, some of these things he's talking about. I decided, you know, in my mind, I can, I'm trying to put together these visions as he's describing them. And I said, well, I wonder what other people think about this, the visions. So I did what any good grown man theologian would do. I Googled it. <laughs> Visions in Ezekiel. And people had different ideas on what his visions would look like if you ever Google that. I was, gonna, I was going to put some slides up here with them, and I, did, I didn't do it. Um, uh, I didn't, I, well, honestly, I didn't think they would show up that well. But uh, you, you can look online and see some <coughs> different thoughts or what they believe that they will look like. But we'll get into that here in a second. He first sees a storm coming out of the north, perhaps indicative of the judgment of God. Ezekiel 1 and 4, I looked, saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning, surrounded by brilliant light. The center, the center of the fire looked like glowing metal. All right, we're starting to get into this. That was pretty easy there. He then observes the likeness of four living creatures, in some sense having human form, each with four faces and four wings. Verses 5 and 6, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. The appearance of form was human, but each of them had four faces, four wings. Goes on, 7 through 9. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf, and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. So they, the four living creatures faced outward four directions with their back parts close together. Tips with outspread wings touched one another, making a square, providing a base on which the firmament, the firmament of God rested. This is, you know... For a southern boy from Alabama, this is pretty outlandish. I don't much care for Harry Potter, to be honest with you. I watched the first movie. It was pretty good. After that, I was lost. I know there's some um, Harry Potter aficionados in here, and that's okay. You will really get into this because it's pretty outlandish. Each creature had four faces. Verses 10 and 11. Their faces look like this. Each of the four had a face of a human being. On the right side, each had the face of a lion. On the left side, the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. They each had two wings spread out outward. Each wing touching another creature on either side. Each had two other wings covering its body. So, each had the face of a man, an eagle, an ox, and a lion. Man, here's the greatest of all creatures. The eagle is the most noble bird. The ox was the chief among domestic animals, especially here in the ancient Near East. 
and the lion, the major animal, and the wild beast. But they are all subservient to the Lord God, the Creator. Verses 12 and 14. Each went straight ahead. Wherever the Spirit would go, they would go without turning as they went. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire, like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright and lightning flashed out of it. The creatures sped back and forth like flashes of lightning. I find this pretty neat, actually, in, in, a, in, in a way. <laughs> Since each creature had a face on all sides, he could always face the Spirit of God without turning. Since Listen to that. Since each creature had a face on all sides, he could always face the Spirit of God without turning. Creatures move back and forth with great speed and freedom with God's Spirit. So then, the next description, if this isn't enough for you, is pretty mysterious and almost unfathomable. Verses 15 and 16. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel, intersecting a wheel. 17 and 19. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome. Their rims were high and awesome. That's why I used to drive an old Ford jacked up. Four-wheel drive, big rims on it. Because the Bible says it's awesome. <laughs> Boats. Yeah, that's what I told my parents. They said, boy, you ain't got good sense, did you? Rims were high and awesome. All four rims were full of eyes all around. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. When the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. So, the four living creatures are mounted on axles attached to wheels. As the wheels revolve, the whole mechanism moves, but it doesn't turn to the right or left. Viewed from the side, it appears that one wheel was inside the other. I actually looked that one up. Uh, particularly on, on Google uh, with this to see what other people's thoughts were. The rims may have had spokes. And the holes where the spokes were uh, inserted may have given the appearance of eyes. Resting on the wings of the living creatures was a platform like a firmament. 22 and 24 says, spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like a vault, sparkling like crystal, and it was awesome. Under the vault, their wings were stretched out, one toward the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. This firmament served as a base in which something like a throne rested. Verses 26 and 28. Above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli, if I say that correctly. I don't know what lapis lazuli is. Y'all know what that is? It's a blue stone. It's a blue stone. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. Okay. Lapis lazuli. I don't have any lapis lazulis that I know of. High above the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up. He looked like a glowing, he looked like glowing metal as it as if full of fire. And that from there down he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down. I heard the voice of one speaking. So seated on the throne, Ezekiel saw the likeness of God. And then the prophet heard his voice. So, there might have been two reasons why God appeared to Ezekiel as it did. First, by appearing to Ezekiel in Babylon, the Lord is declaring that he's the creator and sustainer of the universe and not limited to any earthly locality. Secondly, through this experience, God shows his glory and superiority over all his creatures. Uh, Ezekiel here is humbled in the presence of such glory because he's just a man. He falls on his face. God never lets Ezekiel forget that he is just a man. 
he addresses, in the book of Ezekiel, God addresses Ezekiel as son of man about 90 times. Wow. So God's five commissions then to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 2, verse 1 through 327. Starting at verse 1, chapter 2, he said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet. So, you know, I've always chuckled at this. We'd go somewhere and go to worship and some leader would get up and say, hey, let's stand to your feet. And I've always I wonder, well, what am I going to stand to if I don't stand to my feet? You know? But somebody say, stand to your feet. Y'all ever heard that? No. <laughs> Y'all ever heard that? Y'all ain't going to worship where we've been to worship, I guess, because <laughs> some leader said that. And I always hit Ron and I said, here we go again, stand to our feet. I said, one day I'm going to do a handstand just to <laughs> be different. And y'all be like, I don't think you can do a handstand. <laughs> y'all collect a thousand dollars right now, I'll do a handstand. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but then it's in the Bible here. <laughs> you know, this whole time I've kind of always made fun of that. And I didn't realize it was in the Bible, but yeah, here it is. There it is. He says, Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. So, first commission, I guess, is preach God's message irrespective of Judah's response. He's preaching to Judah, the, the nation of Judah. God charges Ezekiel to proclaim faithfully the Lord's word to the Jews, even if they refuse to hear, even if they even persecute this prophet. Do it anyway. Preach it irrespective of Judah's response. Chapter 2, 3 and 5. Son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites, a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate, stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Do it anyway. Some, some people are going to listen, some won't. Some will, some won't, so what, I guess. It, you know, we're, we're taught to go. We're taught to preach. We're taught to teach. We can't force people to obey. We can't force people to come to Christ within our present day. Six and seven. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid through briars. And thorns are all around you, and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid. There are briars and thorns all around you, and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say, or be terrified by them, though they are rebellious people. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. So Ezekiel's acceptance of God's charge is depicted by a memorable symbolic vision. Ezekiel sees an outstretched hand holding a scroll written on both sides describing the content of Ezekiel's preaching. It says that in verses 9 and 10 of Ezekiel 2. Then I looked saw a hand stretched out to me, and it was a scroll. I mean, just say that. Then I looked and saw a hand outstretched to me. It's like that too. There's a hand. There's a hand outstretched to me. It's got a scroll in it. On both sides were written words of lament and mourning and woe. So then, what's the Lord do? He says, eat that scroll. Verse 3, chapter 3. He said to me, son of man, eat this scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it. And it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Ezekiel's wild, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I ate that scroll. Dude, it's good. It tastes like honey. I guess if it came from the good Lord, that's the way it would be. So the sweet taste of the scroll doesn't suggest that Jeremiah enjoyed preaching doom, but that he gladly accepted responsibility for claiming God's word. You know, even today, some things are easier to preach than others. You realize that? It is. Today's lesson 
I pondered a long time on preaching and regarding homosexuality. <clears throat> you might say, why? It's because in our culture today of acceptance and all that's being preached to all of us, especially, I mean, I was a government employee, acceptance, diversity, and all like that. And I'm okay with that. I don't have to accept sin. Okay? Just because the world accepts that doesn't mean I have to or, or we should. But sometimes preaching something like that come across that I that we hate gays. I don't think any of us do. I hope you do not hate anyone. Gay doesn't matter. Love them anyway. And so, in, in my life, in my time of preaching, I have struggled sometimes because of, 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 of things like this. Well, you just hate gay people. You're homophobic. And gay people shouldn't be discriminated against for jobs and other things. I don't think. I mean, just love them, but I don't have to accept the lifestyle. I think it's a sin. Love your sin. Absolutely. Sermon on giving. You know, I could preach a sermon on giving. If you ask anybody, I say, yeah, preacher preach on giving all the time. <laughs> One time a year. I haven't done it here yet. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the next one is be as stubborn as in proclaiming the message as your hearers are in rejecting it. God declares that Ezekiel carried his message to Pagans, they would listen to it and obey. Uh, chapter 3, 5, and 6, you're not being sent to a people of obscure speech, strange language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely, if I had sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But God is sending Jeremiah to Israel to people who are stubborn and obstinate. Jeremiah's means unyielding and declaring God's word as his people are rebelling against him. 7 through 9, chapter 3. But the people of Israel are not willing to listen to you because they're not... Willing to listen to me, for all the Israelites are hardened and obstinate. But I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I'll make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. You're not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. Next one, receive my words and declare them to my people in exile. Verses 10 and 11, son of man, <clears throat> listen carefully. Take to heart all the words I speak to you. Go down to your people in exile and speak to them. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. So Ezekiel finds himself there in <coughs> present day Tel Aviv, where many exiles are living, sits among them seven days, overwhelmed. Verses 14 and 15, chapter 3. The Spirit then lifted me up took me away, and I went in bitterness and in the anger of my spirit, the strong hand of the Lord on me. I came to the exiles who lived in Tel Aviv near the Kibar River, and there, where they were living, I sat among them seven days, deeply distressed. Fourth one, be a watchman of the people, or to the people. Verse 17, Son of man, I made you a watchman for the people of Israel, so hear the word I speak, and give them warning from me. In Ezekiel's day, a watchman in a city would warn the citizens of danger by calling out or blowing a trumpet. Ezekiel was taking on himself the role of watchman in his spiritual realm. He'll see what is about to happen, and he needs to warn the others of the danger. Verses 18 through 21. When I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person will die for their sin. I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person, if they do not turn from their wickedness or from their evil ways, they will die for their sin, but you will have saved yourself. Again, when a righteous person turns from their righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before them, they will die. Since you did not warn them, they will die for their sin. The righteous things that person did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. If you do warn a righteous person not to sin, they do sin, they will surely live because they took warning. You will have saved yourself. Some deep stuff here. 
And then lastly, preach only when I tell you. God tells Ezekiel to go to his house. He's going to be bound by cords and unable to speak. Chapter 3, 24, 26. He spoke to me and said, go shut yourself inside your house. And you, son of man, they will tie with ropes. You'll be bound since you cannot go out among the people. I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth. <laughs> I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so that you'll be silent and unable to rebuke them, for they are a rebellious person. See, when God is ready for Ezekiel to speak, he'll open his mouth, and he expects the prophet to proclaim his words. Verse 27. But when I speak to you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Whoever will listen, let them listen. Whoever will refuse, let them refuse, for they are a rebellious people. So, that's really your lesson for today. A lot of imagery, a lot of deep stuff. Um, wild, wild stuff, actually, uh, with all of these things and images and dreams. And it, it's, it's amazing to me. Uh, God doesn't, I don't think, speak to his creatures today like he did back then. He hasn't been, because it, most of this stuff would scare me to death if I saw a hand with a giant scroll and, and, then, and then a hand picking him up, moving him from one place to another. I think one place says he picked him up by his hair and moved him from one place to another. Good luck with that. The Lord wanted to do that to me. <laughs> anyway, if y'all have any questions on this, I would doubt that you don't because what do you ask? <laughs> yeah, where do you start? What do you ask? I mean, this is, this is These crazy. visions are similar Maybe only to Revelation. There's not really to, any, to Revelation, yeah. Not really any other prophet that has these weird. Kind of this things. is the wildest ones, Zach. Do we know timeline wise how to, when is this compared to Isaiah? You know, David has a great book that he brought to me on Tuesday. <laughs> we were looking at it shows the timeline. Did you bring that with you? Now? No, you didn't really seem like. So it's it's back on me. I didn't seem like I really cared for it. It's, it's in the Durango. Isaiah was around 100 to 150 years earlier. Even earlier? Okay. This reminds me of the beginning of Isaiah. David Layman is getting the timetable right now. Well, it'd be great to have one in here because that, that is a good question. And uh, with the prophets and, and, and some of them overlapping, some of them out there by themselves and, and all, and especially with the ones that we can pretty much pinpoint it to the year. Uh, it, it'd be good to, to actually see that, and, and, we, and we need that. about 15 different versions with them all over the place. It's, you sort of have to pick. This is the one that I feel the most comfortable with. He, he, uh, Todd's exactly right. When I was looking that up, some of them are so busy, it's difficult to... To understand them, the one that David has is very busy as as, as well. Uh, I don't know how you do it without being busy. Well, well you take I, off. You, know, just, to, you just, just put the prophets up. That's there. what I was about to say. If you had one with just the prophets yeah. that that showed them in the timeline instead of all this other busyness on there, but anyway. I need an electronic one where I can filter this. Okay. Do that, David. Do you remember those? Old, <laughs> do you remember the overlays that your teachers had yes. when you were in school? And they would lay one and lay one and lay one. That's There's what. There's a website that does exactly that. Do that. I'll do that. <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> okay. Y'all have any questions? Yes. Is that the boat? <laughs> that's the that's the old one. That's the one that saw. That's the one that Hurricane Sally took from me. But this next one, bigger, better, nicer, faster. Yes, it's got a quarter body in it. <laughs> and big ribs. <laughs> and I saw a vision from God. <laughs> That's why I'm going with him. <laughs> this is exactly why I'm yeah. going with him. <laughs> and you know what's funny? I mean, I will interpret the vision. <laughs> <laughs> well, it only broke up. So then, I saw a hand form on that boat, and it was only one hundred eighty-five thousand. Yeah. Like, 
I can't right. believe we're going to get that much vote for that little money. I am lying to all of you. There's no <laughs> way to, to get close to it. Everybody else don't vote. It starts really, really big, and we just keep going down. <laughs> so the way you work it is you take your wife to see these $200,000 votes, and then you finally get one for 10. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all I got, guys. Thanks for your attention. We'll see you all next week.